Welcome to the fourth episode of Zero to Autonomous in FRC Java. This is part two of how to use PID to complete the auto line task. In the previous video, we covered why we need PID and the proportional term. In this video, we will focus on the integral term and the derivative term. In the last video, we found 0.5 to be a good value for Kp. And we left off with the problem of proportional control having a tiny amount of error. In theory, if there's any error, proportional control should continue to adjust the robot's position. However, when the error is tiny, the generated output will be tiny, and it may not even be enough to overcome friction, therefore leaving the robot unmoved. To solve this problem, we will introduce the next term, the I term, which stands for integral. Now when we are stuck with that tiny error because of friction, we want to gradually increase the motor output until the robot starts moving again and eliminates the error. We will do this by adding up all the tiny errors over time and using the sum to control the output to the motors. Although the error is small, the sum will increase over time, eventually letting the motors overcome friction. According to this, every time there's an error, the sum will increase, therefore slightly increasing the output. When the error is zero, the sum will stop increasing. And when the error is negative, the sum will start decreasing. The I term also gets multiplied by a constant, which determines how much speed will be outputted for a given size of the sum. The bigger the constant is, the more speed we will output for a given amount of error sum and thus the faster the error will be eliminated. But if the constant is too big, the robot may oscillate. Similar to Kp, Ki is different for every robot as well, and we have to tweak it until the robot performs a motion we like. To find the sum of all errors, we will integrate the error function. And to make the proportional term and the integral term work together, we will add them in the formula. Now let's implement the integral term in the code. We will set up a constant variable to store ki. To find the integral, we will sum up all the errors multiplied by the time interval delta t. So we need global variables to store the error sum and the timestamp of the previous calculation. And every time PID starts, we will reset error sum to zero and the last timestamp to the current time. Each time when we execute the code, we will first find delta t by subtracting the current time by the previous time. Then add the current error times delta t to the error sum. Finally, in the output formula, we will add ki times error sum to the equation. When everything is done, set the previous timestamp to now. For the initial guess of ki, we could very well give any value. But here I'll show how to find a reasonable guess. From our previous test, where kp equals 0.5, we had a tiny error of 0.2 feet. Let's say we want the integral term to accumulate 10% power in one second from that 0.2 feet of error. Because we know the code runs 50 times every second, after one second, error sum will be around 0.2. If we want an error sum of 0.2 to have 10% power, we can thus find ki to be 0.5. Now let's enter 0.5 into the code and see how it works on the robot. This is a graph of what just happened. The gray line, the blue line, and the yellow area are the same as before. The light blue line represents the amount of output contributed by the proportional term. Similarly, the orange line represents the output of the integral term. We can see that the robot gradually settled down at exactly 10 feet. However, it went well past 10 feet in the process, and we do not want that. 
Here's the problem. The error sum is designed to add up all the small errors, but it will also add up all the large errors when the robot is far away from the set point, making error sum very big. When the robot is at the set point of 10 feet, the proportional term will produce an output of 0, trying to tell the motors to stop, but the integral term will tell the robot to keep going forward because of its large sum. After the robot passes 10 feet, it will produce a negative error. However, this will not immediately tell the robot to go backward. It will only decrease the sum and make the robot go forward slower. Therefore, it may still be another while until the robot starts to turn around. Let's try decreasing Ki to 0.05 and retry. From the graph, we can see the overshoot was smaller because error sum had less output, but the robot would eliminate the error slower as well. Let's try setting Ki to 5 and see what happens. Here the robot had an increasing oscillation, meaning the amplitude increased with every period. This can be very dangerous because the robot will oscillate more the longer we leave it. Let's compare the robot's motion when Ki equals 0 0.05, 0 0.5, and 5. When Ki is small, the robot has a small overshoot, but it eliminates the small error slowly. As Ki gets bigger, the robot eliminates the small error quicker, but it also has more overshoot. When Ki is too big, it can cause a dangerous increasing oscillation. Ideally, we want the item to eliminate all the small errors fast and produce no overshoot. But none of these settings can achieve this, as non-zero values of Ki will usually produce some degree of overshoot. One way to improve this problem is to only accumulate the error sum in a zone near the set point. This way, only the small errors will be added, and will thus keep the error sum small. To implement this in the code, we will first create a variable to store the radius of the zone. Then, add an if statement around the accumulation of error sum. Only if the robot is close to the set point will we add to the error sum. The robot is in the zone when the absolute value of error is less than the zone radius. Now, let's choose a radius for the zone. There are two things to keep in mind. One, the integral term is deactivated outside the zone, so proportional term needs to be able to drive the robot into the zone. This means if the robot gets stuck because of friction outside the zone, it will stay there because the integral term cannot help. 2. The zone should be as small as possible to filter out all the large errors. For our robot, we will set the radius to 1 foot. However, after the robot reaches the set point, the error sum will still have a non-zero value, and this will still cause the robot to overshoot. The I limit can only make the error sum value smaller and have the robot come back sooner. Let's repeat the test when Ki equals 0 0.5 and 5, except this time with the integration limit of 1 foot. As we can see, the problem is not completely solved, but it is significantly better. The overshoot and the oscillation are smaller. The second way is to add a third term into the PID equation, the D term, which stands for derivative. As the robot goes from start to finish, the error decreases, so the rate of change of error is negative. 
The D term uses this negative rate of change to slow down the motors by adding it to the output equation. This way, the D term will decide that the robot is approaching the set point too fast, and then slowing the robot down ahead of time. To the robot, the rate of change of error is the slope of how the error is changing. This way, the subtracted output from the D term will counter the surplus output from the I term. Similar to P and I, D also gets multiplied by a constant, which determines how much we want to slow down given how much rate of change. If the constant is too small, the robot will slow down too little and still overshoot. If the constant is too big, the robot will slow down too much too early and take a long time to get to the set point. But once we tune the constant just right, it should get there with little overshoot within a short amount of time. And just like KP and KI, KD is different for every robot as well. To have P, I, and D all work together, we will add them in the formula. To implement the D term in the code, we will set up another constant variable to store KD. And this time, let's just choose a random yet reasonable guess of 0.01. .01. And we need a global variable to store the previous error value. And let's reset it every time PID runs. Then, every time when we execute the code, the slope of the error is equal to the change in error divided by the change in time. And this is the rate at which the error is decreasing. Finally, we will add KD times error rate to the equation. And let's not forget to update the last error variable. Now let's run the code. The graph now has a green line, representing the output contributed by the derivative term. We can see that the D term is slowing us down, but it's not quite enough. Let's increase KD to 1 and try it now. The problem is that KD is so big that for any tiny bit of forward motion, the robot wants to go backward. This is why the robot is jerking back and forth. So let's decrease KD and try 0.1. And it works really well. The robot is going to 10 feet really fast and really accurately, and it does not overshoot. Let's compare the robot's motion when KD equals 0 0.01, 0 0.1, and 1. When KD is small, the robot approaches the set point fast and aggressively. As KD gets bigger, the robot approaches the set point slower and smoother. However, because the sensor input is discrete, the derivative term may introduce some noise which may be more observable as KD is bigger. We can see in these graphs that the ups and downs of the green line are more dramatic as KD is bigger. Okay, so that is PID. Each of the three letters represent a part of PID. Each of them function by looking at the error in a different way. The proportional term looks at the present, namely how much error we have now. The integral term looks at the past, which is expressed in the past sum of the errors. The derivative term looks at where the robot would be in the future through the current velocity. This way, each letter has a different insight into what the motor should do, and the PID controller as a whole combines their point of views and tries to make the optimal output to the motor. As a PID designer, our job is to adjust those constants in front of PID to tell the robot who it should listen to more. In a lot of cases, not all three parts of PID are needed to solve the problem. For example, you could sometimes just use a simple P, PI, or PD controller to get a decent result. 
Whenever you hear someone saying they are using PID or a combination of those letters on their mechanism, it means the robot is using this equation to calculate the motor output. Although the equation is the same, we still have to come up with our own constants, Kp, Ki, and Kd. Because every robot is different in mass, motor power, and even the surface that it's driving on. But after we find the constants for a mechanism, we can tell the tuned PID loop to go to any position by changing the set point variable. In this video, we only demonstrated going to 0 and 10 feet, but you could set more buttons to go to 20 or 50 or negative 10 feet. I hope you have found this video helpful. In the next episode, we will be programming the PID for a robot arm using the Talon SRX, and we will be learning how to integrate it into a command-based code structure. Thank you for watching this episode of Zero to Autonomous in FRC Java. If you find this video helpful, your friends might too. So please like or subscribe, and tell your friends about it. Again, all this code is available on GitHub, the link is in the description below. And if this code didn't work for you, or if you have any questions, please send me an email. Until next time, happy coding!